Well, from what I've heard on these tapes, it seems to me that this company is trying, and trying, sadly, is the right word here, to create a modern version of what was once known as the Panopticum, a prison that barely needs any guards or direct disciplinary punishment. There's a self-controlling social structure in place on these ships. The group needs to work together to survive and maintain stability. There must be some kind of psychoanalytical selection procedure to determine which convict should play what role, because there is a clear distinction between low-level and high-level roles. It appears this structure is dictated through a set of written individual instructions. The group members are conditioned to be highly susceptible to these instructions. This probably isn't that hard to do once the notion of an outside world is pushed from their conscious memory forever. I imagine these are all convicts that serve a life sentence, at least, and there's little or no chance of them ever returning from the DECA mining complex. should have been my fifth or sixth entry, but it's my first. Get over it. I don't follow the instructions you wrote, whoever you are. Whoever sits on the other side of this thing. Uh, by the way, is it your voice that plays on the tape? Before this thing starts recording, is that you? What are you saying? It's our daily dose of brainwashing, isn't it? It's part of what keeps all these people empty like insects. Well, fuck you. I'm not part of your hive. I never was. I'm immune to your tricks. I won't do what you want me to do. What gives you the right to try and steal my life? All of my memories? That's almost worse than murder. That's like turning someone into a helpless shell. Are you the mirror self? Am I fighting in order to be born? Is that what this place is? <sighs> Whatever you are, you're failing. That's for sure. Because you haven't pushed it all away from me. I remember things from before this place. And I, I know I'm not supposed to. I remember my father. I can see him. The image is distorted, but I know it's him. If I close my eyes now, he's standing right there. He's big, and he doesn't wear a shirt. Only jeans and black, shiny gloves. There's tattoos everywhere, and... Lots of sweat. I can almost smell him. But his face is wrong. It isn't human. Where his nose should be, there's a trunk, like an elephant. It dangles. And his eyes are way too big, stretched somehow. It's all very distorted. You turned him into a monster. <sighs> On the other hand, maybe it's not the memory that's mutated. Maybe his face is just different. I mean, my face is different also. I am not like the rest of them. I think I can remember my father talking about the two of us being different back home. It's a scrambled memory, like all the other ones, but I remember parts of it. I remember him trying to console me when I was sad about not belonging. 
I was really young. He explained the benefits of being different, the power that comes with it. He talked about this guy, Peter Parker. I can't remember if he was a friend or a famous person. Dad explained how Peter got special powers through some accident, and it made him lonely. But it also allowed him to do things normal people could never do. Maybe that's how I slipped through your brainwashing protocol. Because of my mind working differently from the other ones. In the end, it won't help me, though. I might be immune to brainwashing, but I'm not immune to solid walls. You got me there. I can't get out of here. I can't run through concrete like Kitty Pride. Who's... who's Kitty Pride? It sounds familiar. <sighs> what I'm saying is... What I'm trying to say is... Now I have to do this recording. Even though I want to do as little as possible of what you dictate. But I have no choice. I have no choice because... One of the insects living with me in here has disappeared. The entertainer. He is gone. And I'm the prime suspect. They're all ganging up on me now. And I feel like I have to tell someone with authority over this whole charade that I don't know where he is. You hear me, evil one? Mama Dry? I don't know where the entertainer is. I have nothing to do with it. First, I thought he left. Uh, the entertainer. I thought he may have found the hidden exit, wherever it is. It gave me hope. But I heard they found lots of blood. So now I don't know what happened. Most of the insects think I have something to do with it. It's scary. They think smearing blood on the wall is my M.O. It sucks. All of them found me annoying, and that was fine. But now they see me as a threat. They think I'm dangerous. Except for the teacher. The teacher believes me. She trusts me. Well, she does most of the time. Sometimes I lose control over my thoughts, and I ramble, and she starts doubting me. Uh, thanks for that, by the way. The psychotic rambling. I think you tried to push my old life out and put in this new one in its place. But instead, they smashed into each other, and now it's a huge fucking mess. Am I Ronnie or am I Nathaniel? You know? Or are the two becoming one, like the storm in the old books? Okay, I don't even fully understand what I just said. That last part was gibberish, right? <laughs> That's exactly what I'm talking about! That's the kind of stuff that makes the teacher doubt me. I have to try and keep my crazy talk to myself. I have to keep the teacher close. I need her. I mean, she saved me from the leader and the cleaner yesterday. The teacher and I were trying to talk about our instructions in the garden room, but then the two of them came out of the elevator, all panicked. They couldn't find the entertainer, so we helped them look all over. By the time I almost reached that freaky black pyramid thing, the leader and the cleaner came out of the bushes and cornered me. They came out of nowhere. It was fucking scary. The cleaner leaned over me like some kind of tough guy, and the leader started asking questions about the entertainer. But I, I didn't know what to tell them. I didn't do anything. What do I stand to gain from him disappearing? At one point, the cleaner asked the leader if he should try and convince me. That's fucked up, right? Convince me? Did he mean, like, punching me or something? <sighs> but luckily, the teacher appeared and she grabbed my hand and took me to the elevator. She saved me. 
The most important thing right now is to keep the teacher on my side. I won't make it in here alone. Like Lucy said, it all started with a house fire. We get many of those, but they usually aren't like this one, obviously. I never seen anything like it before. The fire was fucking purple and green, and the smoke was in all kinds of colors, like someone was cooking a huge ass rainbow or something. You could see it all the way from the station. And considering the colors, it could be poisonous, so I get out of the car, and I started getting the neighbors out of there right away. Everybody had to come out and take a closer look. One of them starts complaining about all of this being my fault. It was a nice neighborhood, big houses, rich people. This fancy old lady comes up to me real angry. She claims to have called the police several times to warn us about the house. She complained about weird smells and about the people living there. According to her, the most obvious drug addicts ever. After maybe 20 minutes of hosing going in and out, somebody finds a woman in the house. Probably late 20s. They pull her out of the attic, out of a child's bedroom. There was this huge collection of comic books all over the floor. X-Men. You know X-Men? Used to be this huge thing. They had actual paper books back in the day with handmade drawings. That's like animation, but the pictures don't move. They're worth lots of money now to some people. There were hundreds and hundreds of these things spread throughout the attic. Anyway, she'd been in there too long. She was burned pretty badly. The chemical fire had kind of eaten at her face. They take her out and lay her down on the grass to check her vitals and all that, waiting for the ambulance to get there. Drifted in and out of consciousness, blabbering to herself. We start asking her where her children are, you know, because of the comics and stuff, but she says she has no children. She lives alone with her dad. So one of the fire guys asks her if her dad is still in the house, but she doesn't say anything. I repeated the fireman's question a little louder, and I repeated it again and again, but the girl didn't say anything. She looked at us for like two minutes, and she finally snapped out of it and told us about a secret door. That's what she called it. She said, there's a secret door. You can only see it from the inside. Press into the wall next to the fridge and it will open. So I was like, this girl is totally losing it because of all the weird stuff she inhaled. But to be sure, two of the men went back in. They pushed into the wall and basically walked right into the source of the chemical fire. They said there were like fluorescent sparks and stuff like that. It's a miracle the whole place doesn't blow up because of like backdraft or whatever. Turns out it was a lab for making drugs and her dad had been cooking in there when something went very wrong. So I look up towards the house and I see the two firemen coming out with the dad. He was gone, you know. He was in there for way too long. They had to carry him out with the two of them. This huge old man. He was like a giant. The whole scene was completely out of place in that nice neighborhood. The colored smoke coming out of the house and the huge old dead man being dragged into the yard. He had no shirt on only jeans, big black gloves, huge arms dangling, full of faded tattoos, and he was burned all over. And his face, you couldn't see it. He wore one of those old gas masks, you know, with the big filter and the glass eyes from the First World War, I think, very old. And the thing had melted onto his face. It was crazy. They couldn't take it off. They tried, but it was stuck. The mask couldn't have helped him, you know. Only God understands why he wore that thing. An antique like that couldn't have worked anymore, especially against the kind of shit he was cooking up. He made these new 
Highly advanced designer drugs, very dark stuff. Back then, it was the newest thing with the kids. I think about that moment a lot, sitting there in the grass while they dragged that guy out of the house. The very thing I would spend the next two years hunting down. The thing that ruined my marriage, probably, was just laying there, right in front of me, for the taking. But I only looked at the old burned giant instead of the girl, and I thought I had it all figured out. I thought that this monster of a guy had kept his daughter locked in the house for years, you know, in her old room with all her old comics and stuff, and she never really grew up. She just stayed in that drug factory, reading comic books and huffing purple fumes for breakfast. I thought she was helpless. She looked helpless to me, laying in the grass. If only I paid attention, I would have saved a lot of lives. When we walked into the kitchen, the rest of the insects were sitting at the table. The farmer, the fixer, and that guy that doesn't say anything. I walked up to them before the fixer could start his bullshit, and I swore to all of them that I had nothing to do with it. I was like, guys, I know you think I'm mad. I understand why you would think I'm mad. I did some weird stuff in here, painting on the windows with food to prove my point. But I have nothing nothing to do with the entertainer being gone. I have no idea where he is. The fixer said he would wait and see. Not in a hostile way. He gave me the benefit of the doubt for a second. The teacher was relieved and she sat down next to the silent dude. He is weird, isn't he? That silent one. I wonder what keeps him quiet. I wonder what his instructions say. I wanted to sit down, too, when the elevator started rumbling. The doctor, the leader, and the cleaner, and the communicator came walking back in. They all looked distraught. Except for the communicator. She always looks perfect. Her jumpsuit fits perfectly around her tight little body. I hate her. No one that beautiful can be trusted. Especially in a place where we get awards for having sex? with each other? By the way, I don't even want to know what the deal is with those sex batches. You just keep that whole part to yourself. You're probably filming us, right? You probably watch all of them at night. That's why you give them awards for being freaky. <sighs> well, I don't want to know. Jesus. I completely lost my train of thought again. Uh, um, entertainer disappeared. Everybody thinks I did it because I'm like Peter Parker. Oh, yeah, right. All the important people walked back into the kitchen, and I don't trust the communicator. Well, I don't trust any of them, but especially her. She told us to relax and not to worry. They were still looking for the entertainer. They were going to find him, and in the meantime, the cleaner was going to work in the dorm, so we weren't allowed in there. That was very, very suspicious. I mean, she wasn't even trying to sound like everything was actually fine. They found something in there, something that needed cleaning. The teacher felt the same. She asked them what was really going on. <laughs> I turned that girl into a feisty one, you gotta admit. The doctor stepped forward and pointed to me. She was emotional. You hurt him, she said. You could feel the whole group turning on me again. I asked her what made her say that. The leader tried to stop her. He didn't want her to say another word, but she got real emotional and ignored him. The whole dorm, she said more to herself than me. There's so much blood. What did you do? The word blood made all of the insects lose their shit. The fixer got up and asked if he should grab me. The farmer also got up and pressed his big fist into the table. I could see the veins in his neck. My mind was racing, but I had no clue what to do to get myself out of this. I still don't understand why that means. I did it, I said desperately. 
the communicator told everyone to calm down. And to my great surprise, she told them she didn't suspect me. Why not? I asked her. She said someone had written something across the lockers with blood. The leader told her to stop talking, but she ignored him like the rest of us. I asked her what it said. She looked down as, as if she was ashamed of it. The line read, the fruitful will live, the useful will live. That doesn't sound like you, the communicator said. It sounds like someone who prefers order over chaos. And someone who's into melodramatics, I added. <sighs> the fruitful will live, the useful will live. What kind of fucking place is this? They were able to save a big part of the house, which was kind of a miracle. I got the girl in an ambulance and started looking for anything we could use against the cook. We were able to salvage a really badly damaged laptop, but the HD was in good shape and it had the cloud login on there. So the AI assistant was able to scramble all kinds of data together. It's always a weird moment, you know, when suddenly an entire drug empire like floats up, you know, to the surface, the dealers, the mules. Anyway, that's when it happened. We were about to leave the scene with the laptop when one of these guys comes running up to me. The ambulance was gone. It never arrived at the hospital. The daughter was gone. I thought, fuck, they got to her. They didn't want her to talk. I still didn't get it. So we go out there immediately and we start talking to the dealers that we can track down through the cloud drive. We needed to save her, you know? She could be an important witness. All of the dealers we track down know about the cook and about the daughter, but none of them can help us get closer to them. After two days, they find the ambulance. It was soaked in gasoline and burned somewhere in the woods along some dirt road, a dead end. We decide to keep tracking down street dealers and talking to them. You know, maybe she's still alive. And after a couple of weeks of talking to those lowlifes, one of them flips everything on its head. This young, strung out little guy, he's completely out of it, talking to someone who isn't there while he's also talking to me. I keep pushing him, asking him about the cook and who he supplied to. At one point he says something like, the real cook isn't dead. The mad queen cannot die. So I'm like, this little tweaker has completely lost sight of reality. But I was completely missing the huge clue being dropped right on top of my fucking head again. <laughs> this doesn't make me look like a brilliant detective so far, does it? I, I didn't get it until he spelled it out for me. So I'm like, who's the mad queen? And he says something like, the mad queen runs the show from behind the scenes the daughter who took her father's place. So I'm like, oh, fuck. We had her. She was right there in the grass, right in front of me. In spite of me letting her go, they make me head of the new unit, the Mad Queen unit. We worked the dealer network for two fucking years, but nothing could get us closer to the real cook, the queen. There were too many layers, too many cells. And the closer we got, the less people made sense to me. The more they started sounding like crazies, quoting comic books, calling each other by X-Men names. I started reading those comics to try and understand her code. I read dozens of X-Men comics, but 
I couldn't figure out the system. I wasn't even sure if there was a system. Maybe there was only drug-fueled madness. And then I get an idea, finally. After two, almost exactly two years of talking to drug dealers and reading ancient comic books, I get an idea. Where does she get them? I asked myself, where does she get the comics? No one makes these things anymore, and almost no one reads them anymore. I was looking for the source of the drugs, but I should be looking for the source of her gospel or whatever. So I start looking into it, and it turns out there's a name for people who read comic books, nostalgia geeks, they call them. People that are longing for the way things used to be, the way they imagined things were before. These people actually get together somewhere to trade or sell nostalgic objects like comic books. They actually physically get together somewhere to do that. They don't sell them online. These people want to hold the books and they want to smell them. I'm not kidding, they actually smell the pages. <laughs> Fucking people. Anyway, I become a nostalgia geek all the way. I grow a ponytail, I stop shaving. And the first time I ever go undercover is me becoming a geek. Not the coolest thing, but I completely dove into that, you know, culture. I visit the monthly trades and I buy those things and, and sell them. I'd actually turned it into somewhat of a business. I must admit, it became kind of fun. I made a small profit for the department. <laughs> Anyway, July 3rd, 2195. That's the day, man. That's the motherfucking day. And I'm at one of those trading meetups. And I stand there with my stacks of comics. I stand there and smoke my e-cig. When some guy comes walking up to me, I notice him immediately. He doesn't look like any of the other nostalgic guys, you know? This guy obviously showers. He shaves and he exercises. You can see the implant mark on his wrist. None of the comic guys would keep their implant. They hate that stuff. I had mine removed for this. Fuck. That was the final straw for my wife, I think. So, this guy walks straight for me. He doesn't look anywhere else. He doesn't look at any of the other comic stacks. He's here to see me. So my hand is on my gun, you know? Safety was off by the time he got halfway. He leans in, and he asks me if I still have a certain issue of an X-Men comic that I talked about online. And I'm like, yeah, it's right here. But he doesn't even look at it. He goes, my boss might buy it. She'll pay good money. Take the comic and meet me out back in two minutes. And he just walks off. And I know, I just know, this is it. So I stick a micro bug in the comic, send a message to the squad, and I walk out back. There's two big black cars and two big guys like the one that came up to talk to me. And there she is. Just standing there. Her face looked bad. She never dared to get it fixed up, probably. She looked like a character from one of her comics. Black hoodie long black pants, trying to hide her fucked up face. I was afraid she would recognize me, but I was told to keep my distance. And she never looked me in the eye. She only looked at the comic book. One of her guys took it from me and gave it to her. And I knew if she bought that comic book, if she took that comic book with her, it was all over. And I also knew that thing was rare and in mint condition. So, yeah, basically, I knew I caught the Mag Queen. And we did, finally. She's been sent away for life. She'll never get out from under me again. I am the cook, and this is my second entry. I'm back in this room because I want to tell you the same thing I told you yesterday. I didn't do it. I have nothing to do with it. 
And this time, I know who you should look at. I know who killed him. Oh, he's dead. Did you know that? We found him, the entertainer. I'm sorry if I'm the first to tell you. He's very dead. And I know who did it. The leader tried his very best to avoid us seeing the blood. He refused to let us go back up to the dorm before the cleaner gave the all clear. But the cleaner couldn't finish. It was too much work. The cone had gone dark and he couldn't see a thing in there anymore. He promised the leader he would finish first thing in the morning. And that meant we could finally go to bed. No one washed up. Everyone stumbled around in the darkness until they found a bed and just fell into it. We were so tired. But it was another of many broken nights. You could hear people moving around and not in the way you'd like, pervert. I also couldn't sleep. I haven't really slept a full night yet, I think. While I lay there, next to one of the insects, it all seemed so unreal. I mean, how could this be real? It's way too absurd. <sighs> when I was a little girl, I remember wondering if all the people around me were play acting, just for me. It seemed like the whole world was a charade, and if I paid attention, I could catch the players pretending. When I woke up in here, that's exactly how I felt again. As if we were on a movie set, but I just missed the director saying, action. And that made the whole movie seem real. Only after I asked the cleaner who wrote the instructions, only after I saw the utter confusion in his eyes, was when I realized this is no movie to them. This is reality. This is their world. There's nothing else out there. There's no one else alive. They have no past. They have no names or identity. They are their role. That part is a bit much, don't you think? Reducing people to their role to the point where they actually have no name. Isn't that overdoing it a bit? Someone woke me up the next morning. I, um... Don't remember which one of them. All the other robots wake up to the light of that thing in the middle of our room like they're programmed to, but not me. I need someone to wake me up, like a normal person. Anyway, the next morning, we could see the blood for ourselves. Everyone was just standing there when I finally got out of bed. It was quite the sight, those eight or nine strangers most still wore their jumpsuits from the day before, lined up, staring at the red letters. The cleaner had started with the lockers the night before, but it was still readable. The fruitful will live. The useful will live. This could be a tactic to keep us in check, the doctor said. She was scared. She didn't dare to point at the leader or the communicator, but it was clear what she was implying. The fixer accused me again, of course. He claimed I wrote the words after murdering the entertainer to keep attention away from myself. He said I love smearing things on walls to confuse people. I didn't even say anything. I'm going to try the mystery functions tactic for a while. I'm just going to keep my mouth shut and see what happens. The farmer pointed out that the entertainer could have written it himself. It might have been a last hint or warning before he died. But it wasn't a warning. It was a threat. That was very clear. It said the useless will die and the fruitless will die. The letters did implicitly, but the blood did explicitly. The leader told the cleaner to get back to work. He wanted the letters gone, he said. His group was falling apart. He was panicking. And he should be. People don't trust each other anymore. Things are unstable in here. And someone is orchestrating that instability. Someone is doing this on purpose. Whoever he or she is, 
That person left something in my locker. I showered and got dressed and wanted to put my stuff back in my locker when there was a key. Suddenly, a key. Someone had put it there while I was in the bathroom. It isn't mine. I've never seen that key before. I don't think I've ever seen a lock in here. I stood there for a while, my stuff in one hand, the key in the other. I ran my fingers up and down the thing. It felt good. The nickel. The stuff my old world was made of. Did someone ditch that key in my locker to try and get me in trouble? Or did someone want me to have the key? Because I'm looking for a door. I ended up putting it back in my locker. I know I shouldn't have. I should have gotten rid of it. But hope made me keep it. Hope of finding a door. There were more clues of someone toying with us. Someone had cut out a part of the fixer's jumpsuit. He started yelling and demanding someone to take responsibility for the damages to his property. He's the fixer. He's always overreacting. But it was weird though, I must admit. The lower half of his entire left sleeve was missing. It was cut off entirely. Anyway, that's when they found the body. The leader tried to get everyone back into their routine again. He promised he would investigate the missing sleeve and he would discuss with the communicator how they would go about finding the entertainer. Everything will be fine, he said. <sighs> the poor guy. I was about to go down to start breakfast when the teacher screamed. I turned around and there he was, the entertainer, sitting in his own locker, the middle locker, the only one without a letter on it. I don't know who the brilliant guy or girl was, but someone acted against their programming, against their sacred instructions, and opened a locker that wasn't his or hers. The one door no one alive was ever supposed to open. And there he was. His face, it was, it was purple. And his eyeballs were almost pushed all the way out. I mean, from the inside, they almost came out of their sockets. He was naked. His stringy body awkwardly bent to fit into the locker entirely. There was so much blood. It dripped out of the locker like a thick syrup. No, the leader said. I walked back towards the lockers. He was covered in his own puke also to make things even more disgusting. The brown mud I prepare three times a day, half digested. It was everywhere. No, the leader kept saying. The farmer and the mystery function left. Without saying anything, they just walked out. And I can imagine why. I mean, fuck. Listen, like I said, I know who did it. I just don't know how to apply that information wisely. I don't want to create division. Everybody might end up murdering each other in here. And that's assuming they believe me. I mean, they most likely think I'm trying to deflect and avoid getting punished. I'm going to go out on a limb here and assume that whoever is listening to this doesn't want all of us to murder each other. So here's what happened. The teacher was the one who woke me this morning. 
She told me she couldn't sleep, and at one point she went to the bathroom. It was really dark, but the lights in the bathroom are quite bright, so when you open the door, you could see the others laying in their beds. She opened the door and saw the farmer, standing there, frozen. That huge man trying to be invisible. He was holding his spare jumpsuit in one hand and the door handle to the men's bathroom in the other. The teacher saw blood on his jumpsuit, lots of it. But she pretended she didn't see him and closed the door. And when the farmer walked out this morning, after we found the entertainer, I could still see the brownish traces of the stain on his back. He turned around right before the elevator doors closed and he looked straight at me with those slow, gloomy eyes of his. He knows I saw, he knows. And now you know, whoever you are, whoever listens to this. And I hope more than anything that you don't want us to die and that you're able to help. Because there's a killer in here with us.